Oh man, do I love food. The LA Times even took notice after I ate at Hugo's nearly every day for 32 years. It was just blocks from my home in West Hollywood. And now I've moved to the motion picture and television fund here in Woodland Hill. And my obsession for good meals continue to simmer. Join me as I explore our food options here on the Wasserman campus. Hi, Tammy. Hi, hi, Phil. Nice to talk to you. It's a pleasure uh, to talk to you. And you're on the other side of the ocean, aren't you? Uh, on the other side of the continent. I'm, the I'm in Boston. All right. I want to, uh, folks, I want to introduce you to Tammy Spencer. And Tammy Spencer has a wonderful, wonderful website called Scotch and Scones. And I want to read something from the website. And I quote Tammy's, quote, fascination with baking comes from her love of science and the magic of bringing together ingredients to produce something yummy. Having said that, Tammy, Tell me, how did you put all of this together? Well, it's um, it's a story that actually starts with a television show, which I guess is appropriate for who we're talking with. Yeah. Um, when we first moved to Boston almost eight years ago, uh, we, we were empty nesters, my husband and I. My younger daughter had just left for college, and he had a contract job out here. We thought it was going to be for three to six months. Anyway, we ended up loving it here, but we knew no one. I was flipping channels one day and I saw a show called Outlander on the Stars Network. And it intrigued me. It's about a, a World War II nurse who gets transported back in time to uh, 18th century Scotland and the adventures that ensue. So it's, it's romantic, it's historic. But it really captured my fascination, my my um, my attention, especially since I had nothing better to do. Uh, well, it turns out this show was based on a series of books uh, by by Diana Gabaldon, and uh, there was a huge online community which I ended up joining. Um, I discovered all sorts of friends through this through these groups, and I also discovered uh, that the New Hampshire uh, Highland Games and Festival was not far from here and it was featured in the books. So I went up there and I had my first taste of scotch uh, at a tasting and I loved it. So I started taking notes about the scotch that I was drinking and I expanded that to bourbons and, and other whiskeys. Uh, and I needed to write down what I was tasting because I couldn't remember what it is. What was it that I liked about it? And I discovered more friends through various tastings, and they taught me how to develop my palate. Well, what I decided then is I needed to start writing these things, these notes down um, in a way that I won't lose them. So I had started a blog prior uh, when we first got to Boston. I had just been writing about my, my love of the city. And so I decided to start writing down the tasting notes. And my now son-in-law has suggested, well, you should do baking, too, because you love to bake. Um, and I said, well, I would call it, what, scotch and scones or something like that. And he goes, ditto, yes. So he created a, a, a logo for me about the five, four or five days later. And after that, I started the blog. And I've been doing this now since um, February of 2017. So it's almost five years now. Oh, well, congratulations. Well, I... <laughs> I've never quite seen a website like yours. It's, uh, it's, I will, it is delicious. And uh, bless your mother for helping putting this show together. I had the pleasure of doing a show with your sister and brother-in-law uh, early on in the, uh, in the original food. But it, it's really quite something to see. And now don't you have also some videos that you want to show us? I do. So here is a sample uh, page from my website. And this is for uh, uh, chocolate chip pumpkin bread, which is an old family favorite. And so what I do with these things is I take a lot of pictures. I create the recipe. I take a lot of pictures. 
give a lot of information about how to make this. And then I do these videos, what I call hands in pans, where I'm not appearing on camera, but I'm taking video of myself making this. So what I can do now is I can show you a really quick um, one minute video. This happens to be for that chocolate chip. So here it goes. Yeah, well, so, well, okay, so we're back to the, uh, we're back to the web, the web page. And so all the stuff that you just saw in the video, mm -hmm. um, I take pictures, and I actually put them in here. So um, here's the original recipe. Um, here are the ingredients you would use, and then so forth, how to make it. And so those steps that you just saw in the video, I enumerate them one by one to show um, what things should be looking like. Um, so I go through all that and I'll kind of skip past all this for now. Um, and then I have a section called questions, ask and answer. So in case somebody has some questions, you know, maybe I can anticipate the questions and, um, and answer some questions people might have. So there's that. Um, I try to do a little pro tip on a good way to, to do these things. Mm -hmm. um, and I finish it off with a little review, some related recipes. And then down below here, this is the actual recipe. So okay. you at home could be following this recipe and make it. So I've given you the pictures, what it should look like, maybe some questions you might have, and then the real recipe is down here. And so that's the structure of, of the website. Um, on the home page, you go to the home page. Um, I try to just give some suggestions of, of things that might be relevant for the current time. So, for instance, of course, Thanksgiving is coming up. So, here are some sample recipes that uh, you might be interested in making for Thanksgiving. Um, down below, I will have other, other types of suggestions, the popular res recipes that people are looking for. So, I, I focus now much, much more on the baking side of my blog rather than the, uh, than the reviews that I was talking about earlier. So if you wanted to see, let's say, what a review looked like, let's say we'll go to a Highland Scotch. And this is, um, I, here's Glen Morangi Alta and Ardbeg Drum. And what I'll do is I'll show some pictures. I'll try to give a little bit about some, some sort of discussion about something interesting about this particular this particular uh, scotches that I'm sampling. And then here's where the actual review starts. So I talk about what the, what the scotch is, it's ABV, alcohol by volume, it's strength, and then my tasting notes. And one thing I learned very quickly when I first started tasting scotch and then whiskey and also uh, so forth, learning from my friends and going to whiskey tastings and learning from experts is that everybody's palate is different. Everybody is unique. What you feel would taste would not be necessarily what I taste. And so it's, it's kind of uh, revealing in the sense that a lot of times when you're looking at the bottle or the box, uh, you'll see what whatever tasting notes that their expert had come with. And they'll say, oh, it has essence of cinnamon and maybe we taste a little leather or tobacco or, or whatever that they're tasting. But that may not be what I'm tasting. And so it's OK. The fact that I'm giving my notes, yours might be different. I'm, a, I'm approaching this um, mostly from a chef's point of view. Uh, I've been baking for, you know, 30 odd years. 
Um, I'm a trained chef. I went to culinary school and learned some really important techniques on how to refine what I do. Um, But mainly what I do now is I try to identify tastes in like vanilla custard or vanilla wafers, clover honey. I'm trying to look at things that I would use as ingredients. So I'm taking the taste of whatever it is I'm, I'm reviewing and kind of breaking it down to what I feel I could use this for. And therefore, that's the flavor I'm tasting. So that's kind of in a nutshell of how I do both sides, the baking and the uh, and the reviews. No, that's terrific. No, you're absolutely right about the palate. Uh, one of my table mates, uh, a resident, uh, my dear friend and Scottish friend, Ida, she, mm-hmm. she has a palate that only Ida would have. And... <laughs> I try to explain that to her all the time. She's funny. She can be hysterical at times. And uh, her choices of food are uh, beyond belief. And uh, But she is a trip. And you're absolutely right. Everybody has a different taste, a different quality. No, that's mm-hmm. wonderful. No, you have a beautiful website. I have to take the time to share because... Uh, I have been a foodie most of my life, and here I have had the pleasure of, in our clay class, of this is clay, and that's I adorable. It, it, it's something I don't know if you can see it over. You can see yeah. the bun and the lettuce and the tomato and the very clever the onion, the cheese, the patty, and this is a veggie burger, if you will. <laughs> And I love it. So it, it, it's, it's sustainable. <laughs> I have I have also gone to the fact this is my green salad. Oh, very good. <laughs> with the, with the carrots and the lettuce and the blueberries and the tomatoes and the tofu and nice. And, and then just uh, one more that I will share with you. This this is my salmon plate with peas. <laughs> and uh, very clever. I have a. I have a dessert that I won't tell you what it is, but uh, mm-hmm. I will see that you get a picture of it. But uh, it will, should be ready near the end of the week. But food food has always been important to me. I really uh, intake quite a volume of food. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's, you know, it's good food. It's fruits, vegetables, fish, and chicken. That's what mm-hmm. I've devoted my, uh, oh, the last 50 some years. And uh, so here I am, uh, 83 and a half, and uh, I plan on being here a long time. And Good for part you. of, thank you, part of being able to do that is your food intake. And so it, it, it is important. And, uh, Tell me something. How has your family been helping you with this? Because once you get started and you've been doing it now five years, you've got to be really busy. So have we got some, uh, your husband is helping? Um, well, my husband helps. Uh, he helps to copyright or copy <laughs> re, uh, edit my, my posts. So once I put them up, uh, he can't see them ahead of time, but I can post them. I can publish them. And then he can go in and kind of go in and make sure my grammar is right. And I haven't made any typos or things like that. So he does that for me. Um, and he's also my financial guru because my husband is, uh, he's, he's in healthcare. He's a finance director for a home healthcare company here in, in Boston, in Massachusetts. And so finance is his big thing. And I let him do that. So uh, he he keeps track of, of the, my finances in terms of I do um, monetize my site. You will you might have noticed on the on the website you'll see ads, right. and when you go to a food website, well any website nowadays, but a lot of a lot of food websites are monetized. That's the only way that we as creators make money is for people to see the videos and the um, the ads that are presented. Mm-hmm. So he helps me track um, the money that's coming in with that, but also the expenses that I have um, there. And there are 
a good number of expenses with a website. You have hosting fees. You have um, various tools called plugins that uh, are that we use to create the site, to maintain the site. Um, then there's consultants that uh, I use either on a one-time basis or on a, on a monthly basis for technical issues. So that, that those kinds of expenses, he helps me to keep track of. My daughters and well, both my daughters are grown. My young, my younger daughter is getting her PhD in um, South Carolina and Clemson. And my older daughter uh, actually lives not too far from here with her husband. Um, both of them are very avid helpers in tasting. So if I want to <laughs> bake something, I can bring it to them and they will be more than happy to taste whatever it is I'm baking. Um, I'm so sorry as, you're so far away. I would be. I know. <laughs> Although I do ship things. Um, my mom, I, I have shipped stuff to my parents uh, in the past. My sister, um, when my younger daughter, Arielle, was in, uh, she went to UC Berkeley and we were here in, in Massachusetts. So I would ship her care packages and I still do to down to uh, South Carolina. So I do ship. So <laughs> there's That's that. Good. Okay. Um, I, will, I will definitely keep that in mind. Now tell me with all of this and the baking, the cooking, the everything that you're doing, has there been something that has been that you'd like to do, but it's a little it's difficult to do uh, or you uh, a particular food or anything like that that you've uh, run across? I most of the stuff in my when I first started blogging, it was more like a food diary in that I would try to make something and then I would write about my experience with making it, which is why my tagline is explorations in the glass and in the oven. As I continue to gain confidence and gain experience with blogging, I've so far kind of altered the, the, the focus to now being more instructional rather than more conversational. So the biggest challenge that I have is time. Um, it was only recently that I was able to devote myself full time to my blog, and I am doing that now. Um, but all of those early posts, I want to revamp. I want to update. I want to do new pictures. So, for instance, that pumpkin bread recipe that I was showing you earlier, that was a recipe I first published back in 2018. And the pictures I had, they weren't great pictures, but they were OK. And the post did OK. But I wanted to make better pictures. I wanted to update. I wanted to add the video where in the early days I wasn't doing video. And I do everything here in my kitchen. Prior to moving here, which was only about two months ago, we were living in a very small two-bedroom apartment. And I was doing everything in my kitchen and my apartment. So all the lighting, all the photography, everything is stuff that I have learned how to do in a home setting. So it's not professional. It's not, I don't have, you know, staffs. I don't have makeup artists or even musicians to help me out. I do everything on my own, including um, editing the video that you saw. So I've, my biggest, uh, my biggest stumbling block, I guess, is has been time because I want so much to learn how to do everything. And there's a lot to do when you're doing this type of work. It's, you're, you're, you're doing the writing, you're doing the baking, you're doing the cleanup, you're doing the, the photography, you're doing the videography, you're doing the promotion, because that's a big thing. It's like how Google finds me on the web, there's millions of food sites out there. And so in order for people to be able to find my site, rather than just typing in the direct address to go to my site, most of the time people put in what's called a search query, how to make pumpkin bread. And so then you have a list of answers that Google supplies you. And where you fall in that list is basically how successful you'll be because people will most likely choose the first three, uh, what we call search engine results. And the way that you have to, I don't want to say game the system, but how you use the system, the system being out the algorithm that Google uses to present those results. That's called search engine optimization. And that is the biggest stumbling block because Google is kind of a, a, 
like a black box. You don't really know what they're looking for. We kind of have ideas of what we're supposed to do. And, and once we learn something, um, you ha- if I hadn't been doing whatever that particular thing is, I have to go back and update all of my posts so that they can be found. So my biggest challenge is finding the time to do everything. And, and I can appreciate it. Now, in, in the positioning in Google, this is, of course, has always been interesting to me. Is this something that one can pay for or has to pay for? Or is it uh, Google makes those choices and sets the positions? Yeah, whatever you're looking for, when you search, when you type a, a search into any search engine, not just not just Google. I mean, Pinterest is a, is another very popular search engine. Of course, there's also Bing and Google Duck and all these others. But Google is the you know the 800 pound gorilla in the room. That's when everybody wants to to satisfy. No, you do not pay uh, for spots except if you're. They used to have uh, sponsored ads, and those you could like pay to get on those on those certain pages. Um, I don't see those as much anymore. And I don't know if Google has done away with it or maybe I'm just not seeing it because I'm not searching for things that would come up with ads. Um, but you do, the, the actual organic way that Google presents you is based on their set of criteria um, for user experience. So they're looking at the site speed. They're looking at the clarity of your writing. They're looking at the quality of your of your photography and your and your videos. What are you presenting to the user? Are you are you structuring everything so it's easy to navigate? So those are the types of things that Google starts to use. And then, of course, there's all the underlying stuff about uh, things that we don't even know how they pick who they pick. But we're all trying to juggle our way, uh, jostle our way to the top, of the first page of of, uh, of of the pages, of the results, if you can. Do you have a favorite that you've come along with that you really like to prepare or bake? Or is it something special? I mean, there's so many items there. <laughs> You know, it's so funny. People ask me that. Um, if do I have a favorite recipe? Do I have a favorite scotch? And I like to say it's it's like choosing your favorite child. Um, I say that when I'm drinking something, when I'm tasting something, my favorite scotch is whatever's in my glass at the moment, because I usually can find something positive about most everything. As far as a recipe, we have family favorites, things that my family likes me to make, but those aren't necessarily my favorite recipes. I just, I like to play. And, and what we talked, what you said in my intro about um, melding science and magic, it has always fascinated me how much um, chemistry, how much math, how much creativity goes into how we prepare food, how, and especially baking, because baking, you were altering, you're, you're taking a disparate set of ingredients, you're kind of putting them together in some manner and presenting it, and it comes out completely different than than the desperate ingredients you started with. Um, I'm an engineer by training, and so the science, the exactitude of this um, has always fascinated me. Um, But there's also creative side. Uh, You can bake a cake, and I can bake the same cake, but they'll come out differently because of the, the way you've put it together versus me or how you've decorated it versus me. And there's just like with the tasting notes, with your palate being individual, your your presentation will be individual. And there's no right or wrong unless you totally mess up a recipe and then it's inedible. But for the most part, the the fun part is being able to figure out how to change your recipe, how to make it not to make it better, but how to make it my own. Um, I'm a big believer in natural ingredients. I try very hard not to cook with things that have preservatives in them or stabilizers. So for instance, one of my recipes on my site is for my own Caesar salad dressing, because I don't like to buy stuff that has all those chemicals and things that I don't have a chemistry degree to be able to understand what they are. So I try to create things that I know what the ingredients are, what goes into it, and I know it's going to be good for me. 
So um, sourdough bread is a, is a great, big example. Um, I have been making sourdough bread uh, for several years now, even before I started the blog. And each week when you're feeding sourdough starter, when you're maintaining a starter, you have what's called a discard every week. You have to take out some of the, the, um, the, the dough that's in there, which is just flour and water, so that it doesn't continue to grow when you have the starter that ate Cincinnati. You know, you have to kind of maintain the volume. So what do you do with that discard every week? Well, that's where the fun comes in for me, because what I like to do is take recipes and alter them so I can use that discard and not have to throw it away. So, for instance, I will make um, and it doesn't have to be just savory things. I, I'll make a sourdough focaccia or, or, or pizza dough or whatever. But I also can make um, pumpkin bread. I can make a spice cake. I've made gingerbread. And all of those things that have strong flavors, you won't notice that the fact that there's sourdough starter in that mix. And I like that I can do be creative in making those recipes my own. You know, you're talking about sourdough. Uh, I did a show with our CEO's one of his children, his name is Nick Beecher, our CEO being Bob Beecher. But Nick has a company called Midnight Bagels. And mm. his bagels are all made out of sourdough. Yeah. And uh, it's it's amazing. I, I'm awaiting Bob's delivery of same. Uh, mm. We're all anticipating something soon. But sourdough is is really special, and uh, wow, that that taste is unto itself. And it is very local too. If yeah. you have sourdough in San Francisco, it has a very distinctive flavor. Um, the sourdough that I bake here in New England is going to taste completely differently because the the natural yeasts that we're using are different. They're very local. It's in the wine world, you call it terroir. So it's the same idea with sourdough. You have a local component. So that also gives it an, uh, a bit of variability. So I just want to ask my own quick, quick question. Having seen you pull up the website and talking about some of the recipes there, mm -hmm. do you have a good recipe for shoe fly pie? Yes, I actually do. Yay! I do. It's, it's a dry version of the Amish pie. Um, I, it's, it's also called molasses pie. Yes. Um, and I made it. Yeah, it's it's a great recipe. It's fun. It's super easy to make. I think it, I can't remember exactly, but I think it has just a few ingredients. Um, another fun recipe, uh, another pie recipe that's super easy is brown sugar pie. Uh, which has truly has five ingredients. It's like pecan pie without the pecans. It's the good part of pecan pie. <laughs> so yeah, that's also on the site. I will be looking on your website. And of course, if you just want to zip over the shoe fly pie recipe, I might even be able to get that started tonight. Phil, would you like some shoe fly pie? Absolutely. Shoe fly. Absolutely. Yeah, I, one of my um, favorites. And you can't find it on the West Coast. You just can't. Um, it's, it is an Amish dish. And yes. truly when I was, when I, I grew up in LA, of course, um, my, my mom lives in Woodland Hills. I grew up in Woodland Hills and my husband and I, we raised our family in Orange County. So we lived in SoCal all our lives until we came here to New England. Uh, so I know you can't find it because I had never even heard of it when I was there. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't until I came here and, and I saw something about it. So, yeah. So have you have you had the opportunity to do any to, any of these kinds of television shows has has anybody approached you or have you had the privilege with any local stuff or national stuff T television no um i back i beginning of the conversation we talked about outlander and um i i went down the rabbit hole of that show um, and I joined the staff of a blog that's called Outlander Cast. So outlandercast.com. And that's a blog that was started by a husband and wife. Um, and they were just discussing the show. And then they started bringing in writers to, to discuss various uh, aspects of the show. And I came up with the idea 
of doing a column for them and I pitch them the idea and they like it, it's called How They Made It. And so what I try to do is take the, the, the show is set in two different time periods. There's there's the late 17th, late, excuse me, late 18th century. So around the uh, 1760s to 1770s, even 1740s, um, and then up to World War II. And so what I try to do is I'll find a recipe that will fit within that time frame and I'll relate it back to the show in some manner. So um, my column, I've been doing this now for a, a couple of years now, and we're about to start the next season of the show. So it's going to start ramping up again. Um, so they interviewed me, um, not, not a live interview like this, but it was in print. So there's an interview of me, how I came into um, baking the scotch and scones and also how I came into finding Outlander and how I create recipes for the show, how I, how I, um, um, how I relate the recipes that I'm making to the show in my column. So, but this is a first, so this is fun. Now with the holidays, have you got something uh, perhaps uh, special or different that maybe you're sort of putting together for your family or, or are they um, going to take you out? Uh, no, we don't go out. We're 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 having we're having Thanksgiving dinner here. And we we in the past we had flown home. So we had gone to California. That was our big time to see our family. Um we all gathered and of course COVID has has greatly limited that that ability. So we're actually this is the first year we're actually staying here in in New England and and having just a very small family Thanksgiving. So I make what my family loves. So one of my favorite, one of their favorite recipes, besides that pumpkin bread that I showed you, um, is something called a black bottom maple bourbon pecan pie. So it's it's a mouthful, and yeah. both to say it and to eat it. Um, but basically, <laughs> what it is, um, instead of using corn syrup in yeah. um, in my app, in my on my pecan pie, I use maple syrup. Um, it's a more natural ingredient. I would prefer to stay away from corn syrup if I can. Um, but I also, of course, being Scotch and scones, I call it boozy food. So I'll, I'll bake with a little bit of booze in it. So in this case, I'm putting in bourbon, and there's a layer of dark chocolate at the base of the pie before you put in the pecans and everything. So that is something that I'm planning on making. Um, what else am I planning on making? Uh, I made pecan bars recently oh. and I shot it for the video for the um, shot video for the site. And so that I just put up and I'll, I have that prepared to bring um, to, to Thanksgiving dinner. So as you can imagine, I mean, Desserts are my specialty. I love to I love to bake desserts. Um, I love to cook as well. I mean, on my site, I don't have too too many like uh, meal main dish or recipes. I do have one. Um, it's a, what they call it's a sloppy Joe pasty. So a pasty is a handheld pie. You know, the Cornish pasties being the the most famous. But basically, a pasty uh, is just a pie. It's like an empanada. Um, so, but in, in the filling, instead of using um, empanada filling or, or whatever else, I put in, I made a sloppy joe mix. And so I put that on. And so that's a lot of fun to make. Um, so I, I have other, so I, some other things, the, the um, salad dressings that I mentioned, I have a Caesar dressing, I have an herb vinaigrette, I have a blue cheese dressing, another dressing that I like to make myself because the ones in the market are just filled with with chemicals. And I just don't like that in my family's diet. So I have a few recipes like that. Um, I also have things that I you do on the stove, not necessarily cook in the oven, like, like um, homemade marshmallows, super easy to bake, not difficult at all. And you can play with the flavorings on that. So one of my recipes on the site are Irish whiskey marshmallows. <laughs> so those are potent. Those you have to be careful of. <laughs> Tell me about yeah, I, I like to do it. Tell me about your Caesar dressing. Have you got a special ingredient that you add to that? Um, not so much special, um, but they're they're natural. So I use I know uh, Caesar dressing a lot of times. It tastes 
especially in the in the restaurants, I find they taste bland. Um, I do. I use um, four garlic cloves. I use I use um, anchovy paste rather than anchovies only because I just don't feel like chopping up anchovies. You know, you can, but uh, anchovy paste is is convenient. Um, and lemon juice. Those are the three major ingredients. Um, and then the other thing is I make. Caesar dressing with mayonnaise, uh, an organic mayonnaise that doesn't have, it's just eggs and oil. Um, I don't use raw eggs in my Caesar dressing. So it's safe. Uh, you don't have to worry about um, raw eggs, people who have um, immunocompromised or pregnant women. Um, so so that's the kind of, of recipe I will I will change to make it safer for, for everybody. If I do use raw egg in a in a recipe, I notate it on the site. You know, this will this will be only for um, for people who aren't sensitive to raw eggs, for instance. Or if it's a boozy food recipe um, and it's something where the booze doesn't bake out, then I will notate that and say this is adults only. You know, don't, don't this is not for the kid friendly. So, yeah, it, it's the. The Caesar dressing, actually, it's funny because my daughter and my husband both say that I've ruined it. I've ruined Caesar dressing for them at restaurants because mine is so good. <laughs> so toot my own horn there. That's very special. No, 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 that's very nice. No, Caesar, I hear what you're saying. Caesar salad is a favorite of mine. And uh, it's, uh, it just varies. I mean, even in restaurants where they will pull the cart up in front. And you yeah. know, do a display of, of making it. Uh, I have never heard any Caesar dressing without eggs. This is very interesting what you put forward. Yeah, and now here's where the science comes in because what you're what you're doing when you're creating a salad dressing like Caesar, where where it's not separated, um, it's called an emulsion. So you need something that will keep the the the, basically water and oil don't mix, right? And you need to have something that will bind the two together. And in, in the case of Caesar dressing, it's the, there's something called lecithin in egg yolks. Um, and that binds the two together. Another binder is um, mustard, but doesn't belong in Caesar dressing. But if you use a, a, a natural mayonnaise, which just contains eggs and oil, it has that ability to also keep the emulsion stable. And so that's why it's safe to use. Um, you're not getting a taste, a flavor from it so much as you're using it for the binding abilities. If you have a, a food processor, um, or you could do this by hand, but I prefer food processor, it comes together in about five minutes. It's, it's not a difficult recipe. You just have to be patient because when you're, when you're, mixing, when you're adding in the oil, you have to do it slow enough so your your emulsion doesn't separate. It's called breaking. So you just have to be slow and, and careful when you're doing it. But it's 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 not a difficult recipe. Well, I like cold salads. You know, I'm a firm believer that uh, there are foods that should be served cold, and there are mm -hmm. foods that should be served hot. And certainly, salads should be chilled. I'm a tremendous uh, uh, romaine eater as against, uh, uh, you know, head lettuce, which has little or nothing happening. And, but with the romaine, it has a certain in, you know, ingredients that is really more helpful to the body. So mm -hmm. uh, like yourself, uh, I uh, appreciate good foods and, uh, you know, and good ingredients. So uh, it really... Uh, you do a very, very special thing, and you have a lot of information for people. And there, there. When you've been doing it this long, you, there will be something that people can can understand to, to look for, and also to ask questions. One of my favorite things is when people comment on the recipes. Um, they could ask me a question. One of my most popular recipes happens to be sourdough bagels. And that is also one of my most commented on rest recipes. So people will ask questions. They'll say, hey, you know, what about this? Can I do it this way? And I'm very good about answering questions. If people write to me, they can they can contact me directly with my 
um, on the site um, with an email if they want to send me an email. But I actually like it when people comment because then everybody else can see the question and I will comment back. I'm very active on social media. If people are on Facebook, on Instagram, I do some Twitter. I'm not a huge Twitter fan, but um, but if people comment on my on my Facebook site, um, I will call if, if they ask me a question there, I will answer the question. So there's a lot of information I provide. But if it's if it's too overwhelming, write to me, ask me the question. I would be more than happy to answer. Well, tell me something about your uh, sourdough bagel, because when I was talking to Nick, he was telling me that one thing that he enjoyed about it is that the sourdough element of making a bagel, that it doesn't stale like a, uh, a regular bagel will. Uh, it will stale rather quickly. And apparently um, the sourdough takes time before that happens. I, I will only answer in that my sourdough bagels are made with the sourdough discard. So I do use commercial yeast to kind of enhance the discard. If I were making true sourdough bread without commercial yeast, um, then, and, and you're just relying on the, on the, on the wild yeast that's in the start on the sourdough starter, um, then yes, it actually has preservation um, factors. Um, I don't do a, I don't use fed sourdough starter and fo follow the processes um, for regular, for sourdough bread without commercial yeast to make my bagels, or, or I have English muffins, I have pretzels, all sorts of things. Um, I still use commercial yeast because my, my main focus with that is to use the, the flour and water that's in that discard rather than throw it away. I'm not using it for the properties of providing this very strong sourdough taste. Mm -hmm. Have you got something special that you might put on a sourdough bagel? Other besides lox and cream cheese and cucumbers and onions and tomatoes? <laughs> Is there some sort of secret that uh, uh, you've come up with or a new display of food or something? No, I'm pretty much a lox and lox and cream cheese girl. <laughs> I do like to put toppings on the on the bagels, so I'll make them plain. I'll put sesame street. Um, Trader Joe's has a seasoning mix called Everything But the Bagel. So if you're a fan of Everything Bagels, um, it's just the the mix that's already pre made, um, chopped up in the bottle, and so I just sprinkle that on. Makes a very good Everything Bagel. We, we have a special guest who wants to come in. I would like to ask Tama if she, Tammy if she's willing to, to give us the recipe for her lemon, do, lemon bars. They are delicious. Oh, lemon bars. Um, I, I do have that on the site. Um, it's, it's a, actually a mint lemon lime bar. So I kind of take it one step further. Again, making it my own. Um, let's see. I could... I could share the screen and I can show it if you want. Sure. It's more most appropriate for this time of the year to have lemons. Lemons. Okay. Hold on. You mentioned so. you mentioned earlier that you have mailed you have done some mailings to me and this is one yeah. of the lemon bars that I have received mm. and even though they were mailed from coast to coast they were as delicious as if it was made right in our kitchen. So here is here is the um, oh, they look there's, there's the video there's the video for it and I'll just jump down to the recipe we don't have to go through everything so for those that want here it is and I can put it right here um, perfect you can take a screenshot or or whatever perfect thank you yeah. you're welcome thank you Tammy I would like to thank you. And I would like to sign off with Till We Eat Again. Take care. Thank you.